Legend suggests that the Starks of Winterfell have ruled large portions of the lands north of the Neck for 8,000 years, depending on your view of the age of the world. They styled themselves as the Kings of Winter during the Dawn Age of Westeros, and the Kings in the North in more recent centuries after becoming the sole dominant Kings. Their rule was not an uncontested one. There were many wars in which the Starks expanded their domain, or were forced to win back lands that the rebels had carved away, or from lords who thought themselves better kings. The Kings of Winter was a title well earned, as they were hard men in hard times. Ancient ballads are among the oldest tales to be found in the archives of the citadel of Old Town. They tell of how one King of Winter drove the giants from the north, whilst another failed the skin changer, Gavin Greywolf, and his kin in a song called The Savage Wars of the Wolf. But as most of the information about the Dawn Age in ancient history comes from ballads, we only have the words of singers that such kings and such battles even existed. The events could all be myth for all we know, but with any myth, there is always an element of truth deep inside. There is, however, more solid historical proof that exists for the wars between the Kings of Winter and the Barrow Kings to their south, who styled themselves Kings of the First Men and claimed supremacy over all First Men, even the Starks themselves. Runic records suggests that their struggle dubbed the Thousand Year War by the Singers was actually a series of wars that lasted closer to 200 years, ending when the last Barrow King bent his knee to the Kings of Winter and gave him the hand of his daughter in marriage. Even this did not give Winterfell domain over all of the North. Many other petty kings remained, just like the rest of pre-Andal invasion Westeros, ruling over realms great and small and it would require thousands of years and many more wars before the last of them was conquered. Yet one by one, the Starks subdued all of the northern kingdoms, and during these struggles, many proud houses and ancient lines were extinguished forever, or in some cases, married into House Stark itself. Among the houses reduced from royalty to vassals, we can count the Flints of Breakstone Hills, the Slates of Blackpool, the Umbers of Last Hearth, the Locks of Old Castle, the Glovers of Deepwood Mott, the Fishers of Stony Shore, the Riders of the Rills, and may perhaps even the Blackwoods of Raventree, whose own family traditions insist they once ruled most of the Wolfswood, before being driven from their lands by the Kings of Winter. Certain runic records support this claim, if the Maester's translations can be trusted. Chronicles found in the archives of the Night's Watch at the nightfall before it was abandoned speak of the war for Sea Dragon Point, where the Starks brought down a Wild King and his allies, the Children of the Forest. The Wild King and his sons were put to the sword, along with all his beasts and green seers, whilst his daughters were taken as prizes by their conquerors. House Greenwood, House Towers, House Amber and House Frost met similar ends together with a score of lesser houses and petty kings whose names were lost to history. The bitterest foes of Winterfell were undoubtedly the Red Kings of the Dreadfort, the grim lords of House Bolton, whose domain stretched from Last River to the White Knife and as far south as the Sheepheads Hill. The enmity between the Starks and Boltons went back to before the Long Night, as it's claimed in the north. The wars between the two ancient families were long, and not all ended in victory for House Stark, as you would expect. King Royce Bolton is said to have taken and burned Winterfell. His namesake and descendant, remembered by history as Royce Redarm, for his habit of plunging his arm into the guts of captives to pull out their entrails, did the same three centuries later. Other Red Kings were reputed to wear cloaks made from the skin of Stark princes they had captured and flayed, but it's possible this is just legend. In the end, even the Dreadfort fell before the might of Winterfell, and the last Red King, known to history as Rogar the Huntsman, swore fealty to the King of Winter and sent his son to Winterfell as a hostage. This was about the same time the first Andals crossing the narrow sea in their longships would forever change the makeup of Westeros south of the Neck. After the defeat of the Boltons, the last of their northern rivals, the greatest threat to the domain of House Stark came by sea. The northern boundary of the Stark Kingdom was protected by the Wall and the Men of the Night's Watch, and to the south, the only way was through the swamps of the Neck, which passed below the ruined towers and sinking walls of the great fortress Moat Caelin. Even when the Marsh Kings held the moat, and the Cranog men stood staunch against the, any invaders from the south, allying with the Barrow Kings, Red Kings, and Kings of Winter, as need be to turn back any southern lord who sought to attack the north. And once King Rickard Stark added the neck to his domain, Moat Caelin provided even more imposing against the powers of the south. Few sought to push past it, and the histories say that none ever succeeded to this day. The North's long, ragged coastline, both to the east and west, remained vulnerable, however, and it was there 
the rule of Winterfell would be most threatened by the Ironborn in the west and Andals to the east. Crossing the narrow sea in their hundreds and thousands, the long ships of the Andals made landings in the north just as they did to the south, but whenever they came ashore, the Starks and their bannermen fell upon them and drove them back to the sea. King Theon Stark, known to history as the Hungry Wolf, turned back the greatest of these threats, making common cause with the Boltons to smash the Andal warlord Argos Sevenstar at the Battle of the Weeping Water. The Stark Bolton alliance truly shows the threat the Andals posed. In the aftermath, King Theon raised his own fleet and crossed the narrow sea to the shores of Andalos, with Argos's corpse lashed to the prowl of his flagship. There it is said he took a bloody vengeance, burning a score of villages and capturing three tower houses and fortified steps, and putting hundreds to the sword. The heads of the slain, the hungry wolf claimed as prizes, carrying them back to Westeros and planting them on spikes along his own coast as a warning to other would-be conquerors. Later, in his blood-drenched reign, he himself conquered the Three Sisters and landed an army on the fingers. But these conquests did not last long. King Theon also fought the Ironborn in the west, driving them from Cape Kraken and Bear Island, and put down a rebellion in the Reels, as well as joined the Night's Watch in an incursion beyond the wall that broke the power of the Wildlings for a generation. Even before the coming of the Andals, the Wolf's Den, being raised by King John Stark, built to defend the mouth of the White Knife against raiders and slavers from across the narrow sea. Some scholars suggest that these were early Andal incursions, while others argue there were forebearers of the men of Ip, or even slavers out of Valyria or Volantis, held for centuries by a succession of houses, including the Grey Starks, an offshoot of House Stark itself, as well as the Flints, Slates, Longs, Holts, Locks, and Ashwoods. The ancient fortress would be the focus of a succession crisis. During the wars between Winterfell and the Andal kings of the Mountain and Vale, the old falcon, Osgood Arryn, laid siege to the wolf's den. His son, King Oswin the Talon, captured it and put it to the torch. Later, it fell under attack from the pirate lords of the Three Sisters and slavers out of the Stepstones. It was not until some thousand years before Aegon's conquest, when the fugitive House Manderley came to the north and swore oaths at the Wolf's Den, that the problem of the defence of the White Knife, the river that provided access to the very heart of the north, was resolved with the creation of White Harbour. Until King's Landing rose beside the Blackwater, White Harbour was the newest city in the Seven Kingdoms, built with the wealth of the Mandalese had brought with them from the Reach, after having been driven into exile by Lord Lomere Peak at the behest of King Perricon III Gardner, who feared their swelling power in the Reach. White Harbour has more in common with the fine castles and towers in the Reach than the castles of the North. It is said that the new keep was built to reflect the castle of Dunstanbury, which the Mandalese had lost in their exile. The west coast and north had also been bested by, by reavers, and several of the Hungry Wolf's wars were forced upon him when long ships out of Great Wick, Old Wick, Pike, and Orkmont descended upon his western coast beneath the banner of King Hagad Hor, King of the Iron Islands. For a time, the stony shore swore fealty to Hagar to House Hall and the Iron Men. Swaves of the Wolf's Wood were nothing but ashes, and Bear Island was a base for reaving, ruled by Harag's black-hearted son, Ravos the Reaper. Though Theon Stark slew Ravos with his own hand and expelled the Iron Men from his shores, they would return under Harag's grandson, Eric the Eagle, and under the old Kraken, Lauren Greyjoy, who retook both Bear Island and Cape Kraken. King Roderick Stark, the first of those, after the old Kraken's death, whilst his sons and grandsons battled for the latter. The wars between the North and the Ironborn would continue thereafter, but less decisively.